Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Today, with all eyes now switching to the Tour de France, we're going to take a closer look at the key preparation race, the Criterium du Dauphiné. There's a controversial crash at the Tour de Luxembourg. Mathieu van der Poel announces that he'll do the Road World Championships this year. Plus, Vincenzo Nibli is back at it already at the Grand Premio Lugano. It's the traditional warm-up race for the Tour de France, and as such, the Criterium du Dauphiné normally attracts a star-studded lineup. This year, it's no different. Triple winner Chris Froome is competing, along with Richie Porte, Roman Bardet, Thibaut Pino, Tom Dumoulin, who's making his return from injury, Adam Yates, Naira Quintana, Dan Martin, and winner here two years ago, Jakob Fulsang. With five of the last seven winners going on to win the Tour de France just a few weeks later, it's easy to see why the best riders choose to test themselves here in France rather than at the Tour de Suisse. In fact, one of the only riders missing because he has chosen to race Switzerland instead is last year's Tour de France winner Geraint Thomas. The race kicked off yesterday with a 142km stage from Aurillac to Jussac. Short but far from simple, with five classified climbs along a route which was rarely flat. A stinging acceleration by Zdenek Stibar of the Kernin Quickstep saw the bunch fractured into pieces, and whilst there would be a regrouping of sorts, that pace would effectively end the chances of the biggest sprints in the race. Sam Bennett, for example, for whom Bora Hansgo had ridden for the whole day, Jose Alvaro Hodge, Nasser Buani, and Andre Greipel. Meanwhile, up front, they still needed to catch the breakaway. Two of the initial six had survived into the final 20 kilometers, Magnus Court Nielsen of Astana and Oliver Narsen of AG Tour. They were joined by Bjorg Lambrecht, who'd attacked from what was left of the peloton, and the trio formed a very strong alliance at the head of affairs. Despite holding onto a lead which never exceeded 30 seconds in those closing kilometers, they proved a hard group to catch. Mitch and Scott did the bulk of the work at that point behind, and they were eventually caught inside the closing kilometre of the stage. It set up one of those intriguing sprint finishes where there aren't any pure sprinters left, and there aren't really many people left to do a lead out either. Step forward, Julian Alaphilippe. He lit it up with just under 500 metres remaining on the stage, looking to set up Philippe Gilbert for the win. Alaphilippe swung off around the final left-hand corner, slowing a number of their key competitors down in the process, and it all looked fantastic for Philippe Gilbert. But what he hadn't reckoned with was the return of the boss. Despite having no teammates around him in that group coming into the finish, Edvald Bursenhagen had managed to position himself perfectly, getting a slingshot around the last corner and taking more speed than anyone to the line. The win marked his first in a World Tour event for close to two years, and in fact the first this year for Team Dimension Data, who will be hoping that this marks the end of what has been a nightmare few months for the team. With his win also came the leader's jersey, but the Norwegian will of course relinquish that at some point when the roads begin to get tougher. Today, to start with, is going to be a tough one to negotiate. Far too tough for the sprinters, not though on paper one you'd have down for a general classification day but it's a stage where almost anything could happen. Make sure you tune into our Facebook page to catch daily highlights of the race. The first day we're expecting some big differences amongst those GC favourites though is on stage four this coming Wednesday in Rouen. That is a 26 km individual time trial that includes a 2.3 km climb at 7.8% average gradient. For Froome, it's going to be the first race of true for the entire season, and the only one in fact before he attempts to win a fifth Tour de France title next month. Then on stage six, we have a heart in your mouth finish into Saint Michel de Morien. There's an eight kilometer climb at 5.6%, which is followed immediately by the descent with similar stats. And that comes at the end of 229 kilometers of racing. A stage well suited to the likes of Roman Bardet, you'd have thought. The toughest climbing tests though come at the weekend, both short and explosive stages. Saturday's got a mountaintop finish on the Monte de Pipe, a whopping 19 kilometers at close to 7%. And then there's the final day into Champery, only 113 kilometers, but with no fewer than seven classified climbs, totaling 4,000 meters of elevation gain. Now I must admit, the Dauphiné always gets me excited. Partly because it's a sign that the Tour de France is now on the horizon, but also because there's something quite special about it in its own right. It's a relatively low key race compared to the Tour, but one which sees almost all the same actors battle it out. My money is on Chris Froome, despite the fact it's been quite some time since he's won a week long stage race. Now, one of the biggest pieces of news in the world of cycling last week was the announcement that Mathieu van der Poel will compete at the World Road Race Championships in Yorkshire this September. It's been talked about ever since his phenomenal performances on the road this spring. Dutch national coach Coach Morenhout was obviously keen to see the phenomenon on the start line, and his wish has been granted. It does mean, though, that he will not take part in the World Mountain Bike Championships in 2019. Instead, he is going to switch his attention to road racing in September, where he'll take part in the Tour of Britain on the run-up to those worlds. 
It's a pretty enviable position to be in, isn't it? Having to decide which world championship you want to go to to try and win. Great for us though, in my personal opinion. I know a few of you get sick of us mentioning him so much, but I for one love the fact that he competes in three disciplines at the very highest level. And I also love the fact that he draws so much attention to the world of road cycling. We basically need riders like him to get youngsters interested in the sport, and I personally can't wait to watch him battle it out with Wout van Aert and the pure road riders on the streets of Yorkshire this coming September. Regardless of your opinion, you'd have to say he's got a genuine chance of winning it, wouldn't you? I mean, he's been world champion on the road twice before, in the junior and the under-23 category. A win in Yorkshire would very much cement his position as one of the most talented riders, not just of his own generation, but ever. Let us know if you think he can do it, and whether that would be a good thing for the sport or not, in the comments section down below. The Tour of Luxembourg may not be the most prestigious race in the world, but former winners of it include the likes of Greg Van Avermaet, Frank Schleck, Jakob Fulsang, Lance Armstrong and Charlie Gould. The opening part of the race was marred by a particularly nasty looking crash for Justin Jules on stage one. Initially, it looked like it had been down to a coming together between he and race leader Christophe Laporte, who'd won the prologue on the opening day, uh, but also to blame were the types of barriers that he used at the race. The bigger races will use sloped hoardings, but others, including the Tour of Luxembourg, are using older style barriers with feet sticking out at the bottom. As you can imagine, this news was not greeted particularly well by his fellow pro cyclists, who voiced their concerns that the UCI seemed more concerned with sock height than rider safety. Amongst them, Oliver Narsen of AG2R, who was quick to point out that Jules would have avoided that crash had they used the barriers like they do in the ones in this photo. Johan Brunil also weighed in, claiming the UCI should spend more time on rider safety and less time measuring their socks, which is a fair point, I think you'll agree. Thankfully for Jules, his injuries were not quite as bad as they could have been. No fractures, although he did have to have some stitches to his forehead. It did mean, understandably, that he took no further part in the race. For Cofidis, though, it was a fantastic race. Not only did Laporte win the opening two stages, but they also won the final two stages and the overall classification, all with Jesus Herrada. That doubled their win tally for the year in a period of just five days. On stage three, Herrada came in three seconds ahead of Maritz Lamatink, whilst the following day, rather than play it safe in the leader's jersey, he once again went on the attack, this time arriving at the finish line two seconds clear of Jonathan Iver. Herrada is, in fact, the first ever Spanish winner of this race. Meanwhile, down in Switzerland, we had the 73rd edition of the Gran Premio di Lugano, a one-day race. There, the race-winning move was sparked by Vincenzo Nibali, who you'd think would deserve a bit of time off between his exploits at the Giro d'Italia and his participation at the Tour de France. Uh, not so. He drew a group clear that included his teammate Matej Mohoric, along with the UAE Team Emirates duo of Diego Ulisi and Alexander Ryabushenko. Nibli tried on multiple occasions to go clear on the finishing circuits, but every time Ulisi was able to follow. Eventually, Nibli would gamble on helping Mohoric at the finish, but it was a bet that didn't pay off. Ulisi and Ryabashenko managed to pull off a rare 1 2 in the race, with Mohoric having to settle for third. In other news, there was a big blow for EF Education first last week as it was confirmed that their Colombian rider Danny Martinez had broken his collarbone whilst out training and would therefore be unable to compete at the upcoming Tour de France. Now he would have been a very key rider in the high mountains to support Rigoberto Ran in his bid to make the podium again. And as one of the most improved riders of this year so far, who's to say he couldn't have been up there on the general classification himself? Now, after a two-year hiatus, the Tour de Bretagne Féminin made a welcome return last week. Driven by local rider Audrey cordon Rago, the race attracted a phenomenal field, including the likes of Kirsten Wild, Cecily Utrup ludwig as well as cordon Rago herself, racing for the French national team. Stage two from Plouet to Pontivy was one of the toughest of the race, but despite that, it did end up in a bunch sprint, Kirsten Wild keeping her perfect record after her win on the opening day. The traditional individual time trial made its return on stage three. At 10.7 kilometres, it's a technical circuit, and 20-year-old New Zealander Michaela Harvey took her first pro victory on that day, which also saw Cordon Rago take over the leader's jersey with two stages remaining. Jess Roberts went solo for her second stage victory in as many days with a win on stage five, but Cordon Rago did enough to hold on to the lead by just five seconds over Wield, with Juliette Labou in third. Now, in a piece of news that we missed out on last week, it appears that the Dutch are considering to hold their national championships in Austria or Germany so that they can have some climbing in the route. 
This is according to Alvamin Dalglad, uh, which said that the idea was proposed by Jumbo Visma manager Richard Plugger, and it hasn't been immediately rejected by the Dutch Cycling Federation. I mean, it would give an opportunity to the likes of Tom Dumoulin, Stephen Kreisweit, Wout Pools, and Bauke Mollema, none of whom have won the Elite Road Championships before. Talking of Dutch climbers, Sunweb announced last week that Sam Omen will be out of action for the rest of this season. Uh, he was recently diagnosed with an iliac artery flow limitation in his left groin, which will require surgery, which will undergo in six weeks' time once he's recovered from the fractured hip he sustained recently at the Giro d'Italia. Get well soon, Sam. That's just about all for this week. Next week, we'll be back with the conclusion of the Criterium de Dauphiné, the beginning of the Tour de Suisse, and also the Women's Tour, which starts today in Beckles. Despite only being in its sixth year, the race has quickly become one of the most prestigious on the women's calendar. Voss, Diagnan, Nubia Doma, and last year's winner, Conor Ribeira, are amongst those taking part. So special is the race, in fact, that Canyon Sram have chosen it to showcase some custom bikes and kit, which look very smart indeed. Uh, Catherine is there to capture some content for GCN, so keep your eyes peeled for some videos coming to the channel very shortly indeed. In the meantime, if you've ever wondered just how much the sports directors talk to their riders during races, handcast a few of the riders from the Giro d'Italia in a video which you can find just down here.